Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saad, for your wonderful introduction. Um, uh, a very good evening from Bangladesh. This is Dr. Asina Jahan Lopa. Uh, I'm working as consultant and in charge in intensive care unit in MA Shamrita Hospital and Medical College, Dhaka. Uh, today, uh, I'm delighted and uh, honored to be here as a session moderator because we have uh, eminent speakers across the world with us. And um, I really, I'm really thankful to uh, Mega Learning also because I uh, like the slogan that uh, learn, engage, and connect. And it's a very continuous academic um, initiative. And I think uh, uh, attendees and participants across the world will uh, enjoy and we will learn new things. So uh, today uh, we have uh, eminent speakers with us and it's divided into three parts. We have three lectures with us. So um, first of all, we have with us Professor John Doyle, who will uh, talk on anesthesia for obese patient. And Dr. Doyle is uh, with the Department of General Anesthesiology, Cleveland Clinic, as well as Professor of Anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve, uh, Reserve University. Dr. Doyle uh, received his MD degree in 1982 and his PhD degree in biomedical in engineering in 1986, both from University of Toronto. He received his Canadian board certification in anesthesia in 1986 and his American certification in 1989. Dr. Doyle has a long-standing interest in ENT anesthesia and difficult airway management as well as an interest in the use of technology in medicine. His research has been supported by a number of funding agencies and he holds positions on a number of editorial boards. Dr. Doyle is past president of both the Society of Air Management and the Society for Technology in Anesthesia. He has received clinical teaching awards on four occasions. So today, uh, yeah, he will, uh, he will be in our first lecture, and his topic is anesthesia for obese patient. So welcome, Dr. Uh, uh, John Joel. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully everyone can see me without any difficulties. The presentation today is anesthesia in the obese patient. And many of you will have clinical experience with this as this is becoming a condition with increasing frequency. As you can see on the right here, the gastric bypass procedure is one of the many common procedures carried out in these patients in order to uh, fight their obesity. So let's start by taking a look at our learning objectives. At the end of this presentation, participants should be able to describe the pathophysiology of obesity, describe what we call the obesity paradox, which I think you'll find quite interesting, describe how obesity impacts on perioperative management, describe the optimal airway management of obese patients, and describe the optimal ventilation of obese patients. <clears throat> this is one of the buildings at Cleveland Clinic where I practice. And it's one of the largest institutions uh, in the United States. And they take on all sorts of uh, uh, anesthetic procedures and surgical procedures, including, of course, a very large bariatric program. Here, in fact, is the largest patient I've had uh, to deal with. This gentleman weighed 445 pound, uh, kilograms, 980 pounds. Uh, and uh, the uh, challenge to intubate him is something that we described in the literature and you can easily find uh, more about that in another presentation. The medical complications of obesity are well known to us. They affect um, pulmonary disease, for example, obstructive sleep apnea that I'll mention in a moment, hypoventilation syndrome that I'll mention in a moment as well, problems with fatty liver disease, gallbladder disease, uh, osteoarthritis, phlebitis, predisposition to cancer, predisposition to pancreatitis, and of course, coronary disease, especially that related to diabetes. So the medical complications are well known, and that explains part of the interest in bariatric anesthesia and surgery. There are a number of potential problems associated with obesity, and we're going to go over some of them. Reduced functional residual capacity, which means early desaturation with apnea, 
airway obstruction using a face mask. We'll talk about that in a moment. Possible difficulty with intubation in patients with a short neck, a large tongue, or redundant folds of oropharyngeal tissue. More about that in a moment as well. There's decreased chest wall compliance that shows up as a restrictive, uh, restrictive lung defect. There is an increased degree of airway closure showing up as hypoxemia. When a surgical airway, such as a crike or a trach, has to be carried out, they can be difficult and dangerous because of difficulty in identifying the various anatomical structures. And then one of the questions is, is there a risk of regurgitation and aspiration? And we'll address that as well. One of the common things we find is that patients come to the hospital bringing their own CPAP device. Here's a gentleman with a nasal CPAP device, but obesity predisposes to obstructive sleep apnea. And this can be a problem in recovery room after the patients receive doses of opioids or other respiratory depressant medications. Uh, there is a review article on the right, which I'd like to bring to your attention. I'm not going to go through it in detail other than to say that adipocytes are far more than simple lipid storage vessels. Adipocytes secrete adipokines and they attract and activate inflammatory cells that have multi-system effects such as vascular and cardiac remodeling, airway inflammation, and altered microvascular flow patterns. And adipocytes are linked to abnormalities such as insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. The adipocyte derived proteins can be anti-diabetic, and these are one shown in the green arrows, as well as some that predispose to hyperglycemia shown with the, um, the green arrows. So what this shows us is that they are far more than lipid storage vessels. And there's a reason why this is important, and that deals with the role of adipocytes in COVID-19. And this is an abstract from Obesity, the journal. And what I want to bring to your attention is a particular statement from there. It says, expression of angiotensin converting enzymes, the functional receptor for the COVID-19 virus, is upregulated in adipocytes in patients with obesity and diabetes, which turns adipose tissue into a potential target and viral reservoir. So that is the link between obesity and the predisposition to catching COVID-19. Now, many of you will have experience with uh, bariatric procedures carried out for uh, obese patients as part of their treatment. When they do lose weight, their um, uh, problem with hyperglycemia tends to get better and their problems with liver disease tends to get better. There's a variety of procedures. The adjustable gastric band remains popular. The Ruan Y is very effective. Sometimes the vertical uh, sleeve gastrectomy uh, is, is carried out. And this is particularly common at my institution. And another condition is the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal um, switch. But uh, it's the Ruan Y and the vertical sleeve gastrectomy that I see most common at Cleveland Clinic where I practice. Now here is a cautionary tale. This comes to me uh, from the very early days of my anesthesia practice when I was notified of this case. Um, uh, through a report. And it developed my interest in management of the obese patient as well as problems with uh, airways. So we had a morbidly obese man scheduled for gastroplasty. This man got thiopental and succinylcholine, but they couldn't intubate him and they really couldn't ventilate him that well. The succinylcholine wore off and the patient woke up. And then the anesthesia team tried to figure out what to do best. And they decided it'd be best to take a break and reschedule a guy for a few weeks in the future to find out uh, what a better plan would be. Uh, many of us know that a better plan would be awake fiber optic intubation, uh, but here's what actually happened. For the second anesthetic, they decided that the gentleman was not relaxed enough. And instead of using succinylcholine, they used a big dose of pancuronium. Again, they couldn't intubate. And again, they had trouble with ventilation. But this time, bradycardia set in, a cardiac arrest occurred, the patient died, and there was a coroner's inquest. And this came to my attention as a result of that. This was the days before we could rescue an airway with superglottic airways, such as a laryngeal mask airway. Uh, and it was the day before even the 
American Society of Anesthesiologists difficult airway algorithm, but it brought to everyone's attention the concern of the obese patient. Now let's begin with some definitions the total body weight is the actual weight in kilograms. The body mass index is total body weight divided by the uh, uh, height squared. We have ideal body weight, uh, the height in centimeters minus 100 for men and minus 105 for women. And this patient said to be obese with a BMI over uh, 30, said to be overweight with a BMI over 25, morbid obesity. Uh, some definitions say 35. More commonly, it says 40. And uh, these are some of the definitions that we'll use. These are taken from the European Journal of Anesthesiology. There is a special interest group called the International Society for the Perioperative Care of the Obese Patient that has been producing a lot of useful resources for us uh, people who will take care of these patients. They say that the purpose of the society is to promote evidence and uh, expert opinion-based care of patients with obesity from perioperative care and testing through intraoperative care until leaving the hospital. So a lot of useful resources from here, and they have a website that you can see here. Here is a focus on the website. And on the bottom here, they say they just published online for anesthesia and analgesia is a review article called The Obese Patient, Facts, Fables, and Best Practices. And it turns out that this is a very useful article. Yeah, uh, here it is here in abstract form. And this is published by uh, Tiffany Moon and her colleagues. And it uh, comes with a number of take home points that I wanna bring to your attention. And it's best described in terms of this uh, um, chart. And it says the most recent closed claims analysis indicates that obesity was the main factor in claims associated with extubation or recovery. And extubation directly uh, uh, to non-invasive ventilation improves oxygenation. So if you extubate and then go directly to CPAP, for example, or BiPAP, you improve oxygenation. There's a 23% increase in the mean arterial uh, oxygen tension with 25 degrees of reverse Trendelenburg. And they have four points here that I'd like to go over. These are some good take-home points. The first one is that the forearm non-invasive blood pressure measurements may be more reliable than lower extremity non-invasive blood pressure uh, readings. So it's not uncommon that we cannot put the blood pressure uh, cuff on the arms. We have to put it on the forearm, and this is probably better than putting it on the leg. The second point is that if the BMI is over 50, you'll want to administer three grams of cefazolin for surgical prophylaxis in cases where cefazolin is chosen. Other places have that rule uh, at over 100 kilograms, depending on where they practice. A third point is that obese patients have an increased baseline antral cross-sectional area when assessed with gastric uh, point, uh, point of care gastric ultrasound, which implies uh, a larger gastric volume. And so more and more people are doing bedside gastric ultrasound to look at what the gastric volume might be in patients to find out whether a rapid sequence induction may or may not be appropriate. But we do know that there is the possibility of increased gastric volume in these patients. And finally, vasoactive drugs such as dopamine and vasopressin should be dosed according to total body weight and not ideal body weight. So these are four take-home points from this article, The Obese Patient Facts, Fables, and Best Practices, which I bring to your attention. It's from January of this year, so it's very much up to date. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Obesity may be related to dopamine. Obese patients have reduced dopamine receptor availability to compare to controls with an inverse relationship between dopamine receptor availability and body mass index. Two hypotheses have been proposed to explain this. The first one is that individuals with obesity are born with a deficiency of dopamine receptors. Understimulation of dopaminergic reward circuits occur with overeating as a compensation. The second hypothesis is that dopaminergic receptor activities is initially normal, but becomes down-regulated as a result of chronic overstimulation of dopaminergic pathways. Understanding what is going on here in detail, of course, provides the possibility for anti-obesity uh, drugs. One thing we've noticed that um, there is a big uh, cultural variation in obesity. Uh, in France, where obesity is not that common, uh, we find out that the patients 
uh, or the uh, citizens stop eating because the food uh, uh, internal cues suggest that the, 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 their stomach is filled. Whereas the United States, uh, they tend not to stop eating. Uh, the cues for that seem to be less strong. So Parisians are 1.5% uh, 1.5 times more likely to stop eating because of internal cues like feeling full than people say from Chicago. This is from Obesity Research, the journal 2007. One of the things that particularly uh, surprising is called the obesity paradox. In some studies, being overweight is associated with increased survival time in the ICU uh, and in hospital, creating U-shaped mortality curve. So you can see for various ages going from 20, which is the uh, dark brown, all the way up to 70, which is the bright yellow. You can see that the lowest mortality rate shifts towards higher BMIs with increasing age. And uh, this has some clinical implications for people who work in the intensive care unit. And it's called the obesity paradox. Although obesity has long been considered a contributor to poor surgical outcomes, recent studies in critical care medicine suggest that overweight and obese patients may paradoxically have better outcomes than normal weight patients. And uh, they found that this is the case uh, in a study of 11,000 Canadians and they uh, found that heavier dialysis patients had lower mortality rate than normal weight or underweight patients. And same with the study about coronary disease, diabetes, stroke, and high blood pressure. Let's take a look at surgical and ICU patients as well. So two review articles I'll bring to your attention. This one here, the obesity paradox in cardiovascular disease. And this other one, the obesity paradox in chronic disease facts and numbers are two articles that I bring to your attention should you be interested in more details. But here's some uh, more information on this. In a study of patients undergoing non-bariatric general surgery, the risk of death according to the BMI exerted, exhibited a reverse J-shaped relationship with the highest rates in the underweight and morbidly obese extremes and the lowest rates in the overweight and moderately obese patients. There was a progressive increase in the likelihood of a complication with increasing BMI class, almost entirely due to increased rates of wound infections. So bigger BMI, more wound infections. So here is ICU survival uh, for males and for females. And you can see that the overweight and obese patients have an advantage over the patients with a normal BMI or patients who are underweight or patients who are very obese. And that of course is paradoxical, hence the obesity paradox. Here for heart failure survival, those patients that did the best were obese and overweight and did better than those that were underweight or had the recommended weight in terms of survival over time for heart failure. In patients with peripheral artery disease, uh, often many of these patients who are underweight had associated severe COPD Excess mortality among underweight patients with peripheral arterial disease may be due to overrepresentation of individuals with moderate to severe COPD. And this may explain part of the obesity paradox in the uh, peripheral artery disease population. What about heart failure? The association of body mass index and unadjusted all cause mortality in a group of over 7,000 patients with stable heart failure. Uh, it were enrolled in the Digitalis investigation group. Each patient represents a mortality rate associated with the BMI. And as you can see, the mortality rate is, uh, is best around those patients that are overweight or slightly obese. Now let's move on to the special challenges associated with the obese patient. We have difficulties with IV access, patient positioning, airway management, um, particularly mask ventilation and intubation. Ventilation may require higher pressures because of the restrictive lung defect. Oxygenation difficulties may occur because of a small functional residual capacity. There's a tendency to airway obstruction with obstruction of sleep apnea and comorbid additions, particularly coronary disease, diabetes type two are commonly present. Now the University of Florida Shands Bariatric Program has some recommendations and they are shown here. These are the kinds of things you will want to go through. Height, weight, BMI, malampati classification, a review of history of sleep, uh, obstructive sleep apnea and find out if they're on CPAP or BiPAP. And they recommend a baseline venous blood gas included in the routine lab studies to detect if hypoventilation or CO2 retention exists. 
So uh, this is part of how these patients are analyzed preoperatively in the uh, University of Florida bariatric program. Difficult mask ventilation is something that we're all familiar with in the patient uh, uh, who is obese. Uh, in this study by Lancheron, now 20 years old, they found that the predictors of difficult mask ventilation were patients who were old for 55, BMI over 26, in other words, in the overweight or obese category, patients who are out without teeth, the edentulous patients, patients with beards, and patients who snore. And you can see uh, in such patients, it's very common that people go directly to an oropharyngeal airway or sometimes a nasopharyngeal airway before attempting mask ventilation. The difficulty of intubation also increases with neck size. Uh, this study by Collins and all showed that difficulty with intubation increases with bigger necks. In a patient with a neck size of 40 centimeters, the odds of a tough intubation are 5%. And at 60 centimeters neck circumference, the odds increase to 35%, which of course is why some people would go directly to video laryngoscopy or even uh, fiber optic uh, laryngoscopy uh, rather than uh, direct laryngoscopy, they would go commonly video laryngoscopy. More stuff from the University of Florida Shands bariatric program. They talk about the value of the GlideScope or the store system. The uh, McGrath is also popular as a video laryngoscope. And they recommend the ramped position, as you can see here, um, where we take a number of sheets or a special ramping device uh, to move the patient from position A shown here to position B shown below. Here is, for example, the standard position uh, of the obese patient on the operating table. These patients can be more difficult to intubate in this uh, circumstance, and so they are often have an improved position using the ramp, uh, using a whole pile of sheets or pillows such as shown here. One thing you can do is get a special pillow that elevates things appropriately. Uh, here's the 375 pound patient. And uh, that's well over a hundred and some kilos. With the troop elevation pillow, you can see the structures line up to allow intubation. Uh, in the UK, they have the Oxford elevation pillow uh, and carries out the same task. Another thing you'll want in these patients is the difficult airway cart. And you'll want fiber optic bronchoscope, video laryngoscope, such as a GlideScope, airway introducers, airway exchange catheters can be useful and supraglottic airways can be helpful. Here is the original GlideScope with uh, black and white that we introduced at Cleveland Clinic in 2003. And here is uh, me intubating uh, one of the patients, uh, teaching the residents and other people how to use video laryngoscopy. Uh, so here's a comment from 2004, so uh, almost 20 years ago, we found that the principal limitation in using a glidescope is not getting a good view of the glottis, but in manipulating the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords. And we have found that a hockey stick position, such as this shown here, is often more helpful than the traditional uh, position for uh, an endotracheal tube stylet. Uh, it's difficult to intubate using video laryngoscopy in most cases, unless a, a stylet is used. And here is an example of what we saw at laryngoscopy using video laryngoscopy in my initial case series. Now, what about rapid sequence inductions? In this particular article from 2006, they found that in 150 consecutive morbidly and super morbidly obese patients, awake fiber optic intubation was used in only 6 to 7%, and the remaining 93 to 94% were done with a rapid sequence induction with propofol or thiopentone, uh, followed by succinylcholine at 1.5 milligrams per kilogram total body weight. Uh, so that they did the thiopentol uh, with total body weight, and they did the propofol with ideal body weight. Uh, something to bear in mind. But they did the rapid sequence uh, for most of these patients, uh, fiber optics for some. Uh, do all patients need fiber optic, uh, do all patients need a rapid sequence induction? It's a common procedure in obese patients who appear to be at more risk for both pulmonary gas aspiration and difficult airways. Uh, and the elective uh, obese or sleep apnea patient with no other risks for pulmonary aspiration, the risks and benefits of rapid sequence induction and correct pressure should be weighed. 
if rapid sequence induction is required, succinylcholine remains the neuromuscular blocking agent of choice, and there are no con contraindications. Now, this is from 2005, but I'd remind some people now um, that there are some people who would be more comfortable with high dose rocuronium. Um, now that uh, Sugamidex is available for rapid reversal, should it be needed? And there's some controversy about what the best choice would be. Should all obese patients uh, or patients with obstructive sleep apnea get a rapid sequence induction? In this review from 2010, the authors say that the decision as to whether to use rapid sequence induction and awake intubation or standard induction with hypnotics should depend on a thorough examination of the airway and comorbidity and should not be based solely on whether morbid obesity is present or not. So some controversy as to when uh, rapid sequence induction is appropriate. But many people would argue not needed in a patient merely because of morbid obesity, but there may be comorbidity such as gastroparesis that suggests that rapid sequence is very important. So they emphasize RSI is probably not necessary in fasted patients with no risk factors other than obesity. Another thing you may found, find in these patients is obesity hyperventilation syndrome, also known as Pickwickian syndrome. After the uh, article of uh, the book called The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens, uh, a classic book. Obesity hyperventilation syndrome is characterized by hypersomnolence, right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, polycythemia, hypoxemia, and hypercapnia. And this is one of the reasons why venous blood gases or arterial blood gases are often recommended at the patient evaluation. Now, patient's lungs are complicated by obesity. The functional residual capacity uh, is uh, decreased in obese patients. The reduced oxygen reserve is compounded by a larger metabolic de demand. So pine tidal volume is often less than the closing volume predisposing to hypoxemia. Maximal preoxygenation is necessary. Now we're all familiar with this particular diagram of the various lung volumes and their definitions. This is just to familiarize you. Let's take a look at what happens with the effective position on lung volumes. On the left, you can see the functional residual capacity is larger than the closing capacity in the non-obese patients. When the obese patient is uh, in the upright position, you can see that the functional residual capacity is lower, but it's still above the residual volume, and but below the closing capacity. With the supine position, it gets worse with the obese patient. And when the patient is put into the Trendelenburg position, um, often required for bariatric surgery, you can see that the FRC is well below the closing capacity and this predisposes to hypoxemia. One of the things that you will get is a restrictive pattern of uh, volumes that you would get in obesity, as opposed to an obstructive pattern that you would expect with asthma or with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The key thing here is that this restrictive pattern leads to a reduction in functional residual capacity. In a normal patient, as shown on the top, you'll get some atelectasis when you put the patient to sleep and you uh, have anesthesia and paralysis. In the obese patient, as you can see, there's more atelectasis than you would get with a normal non-obese patient. But in both cases, atelectasis is associated with anesthesia and paralysis. So there are factors affecting mechanical ventilation in obese patients. The supine position reduces lung volumes, decreases respiratory compliance, and the chest wall compliance has decreased since increased abdominal girth pushes against the diaphragm, and this reduces functional residual capacity. Now, frequently, these bariatric procedures are carried out with laparoscopic uh, technique. The uh, pneumoperitoneum from CO2 inflation. Insufflation causes systemic changes. Trendelenburg positioning can worsen these changes. Systemic vascular resistance is increased with intra, increased intra-abdominal pressure. Compression of the inferior vena cava occurs at a pressure of around 20 uh, millimeters of mercury with decreased lower venous return and decreased cardiac output. 
Hypercarbia and hypoxemia can be caused by ventilation perfusion mismatching and absorption of CO2 can worsen hypercarbia and acidosis requiring hyperventilation to set it off. Things you have to worry about are gas embolism, pneumothorax and mediastinal emphysema when procedures are done uh, laparoscopically in these procedures. One thing we can do that's very important is alveolar recruitment. Uh, and an alveolar recruitment maneuver is the use of a high sustained positive airway pressure to increase end expiratory lung volume and re-expand atelectatic lung areas. In non-obese patients during anesthesia, an initial pressure of at least 40 centimeters of water is done to re-expand atelectatic lungs. Three conditions are required. The insufflation pressure must exceed the critical opening pressure uh, to uh, open collapsed alveoli. Typically, that's around 40 centimeters of water. Inspiratory pressure must be maintained. And to maintain open alveolar recruitment needs to be followed by adequate levels of PEEP. And this maneuver increases oxygen tension in anesthetized obese patients. And here we have uh, an important study carried out published in the British Journal of Anesthesia, they had four groups. And on the top, patients who uh, just received PEEP. On uh, below that, patients who just got a recruitment maneuver, which was 40 centimeters of water for 15 seconds. Then they had number three, a recruitment maneuver followed by 10 centimeters of PEEP. And finally, number four, recruitment maneuver uh, that was repeated every 10 minutes followed uh, and continuous with PEEP at 10 centimeters of water. And that uh, turned out to be the best method for maintaining respiratory compliance and oxygen tension levels. Repeated recruitment maneuvers to 40 centimeters of water for 15 seconds in conjunction with PEEP. Here in an article from JAMA, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association from two years ago, among obese patients undergoing surgery under general anesthesia, an intraoperative mechanical ventilation strategy with higher level of PEEP and alveolar recruitment maneuvers compared to a strategy with lower level of PEEP did not reduce postoperative pulmonary complications. For more information on this fascinating topic, here is a book that was published three years ago, Mechanical Ventilation in the Critically Ill Obese Patient. And it has a series of articles that you may find useful. Here's some clinical pearls for managing obese patients. High tidal volumes do not improve oxygenation, but do increase the risk of lung injury. We suggest the use between six and eight um, milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Isolated use of PEEP is not affected. It must be done in conjunction with alveolar recruitment maneuvers such as we just shown. And the recruitment maneuvers needs to be followed by adequate levels of PEEP. And we now know these recruitment maneuvers should be re, um, repeated every 10 minutes. Now, morbidly obese patients are at higher risk of respiratory obstruction soon after extubation. And in those patients that are difficult to intubate, extubation over an airway exchange catheter should be considered. Patients should be fully awake and responding to commands before extubation. Now, finally, uh, an important issue is what are the pain control options for these patients? Uh, local anesthetics are often used uh, at the surgical field. Epidurals and blocks can be helpful. non anti-inflammatory drugs can be helpful. Acetaminophen or paracetamol can be very useful. And we recommend the limited use of opioids because of the possibility of respiratory obstruction postoperatively. Um, in our hospital, the use of non steroidal anti inflammatory agents is commonplace, as well as the use of acetaminophen, either intravenous or by some other route. So, the take home points for this presentation obesity presents many potential challenges to the anesthesiologist. Anesthesia reduces functional residual capacity to approximately half the pre-induction value in obese patients, prompting atelectasis, and this reduced oxygen reserve is compounded by a larger metabolic demand. Airway management can be difficult, both mask ventilation and intubation. The application of rapid sequence seduction is probably not necessary in fasted patients with no risk factors other than obesity. And alveolar recruitment maneuver improves oxygen tension in anesthetized obese patients with lung atelectasis. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Again. Oh, 
thank you dr joel for your excellent and informative lecture you have covered uh, all the things because uh, here uh, we learned about the obese patients best practice you uh, uh, you have said about the obesity paradox special challenge in uh, obese patient and uh, the main thing is the icu survival uh, as you survival, heart failure survival, special challenges in obese patient. And the thing is very important that the, uh, the factors which are affecting in obese patients and the alveolar recruitment menu, uh, maneuver of management in obese patients, this is very much important. And also the post-operative pain control uh, in obese patients. So um, I think uh, uh, Sir has to uh, leave after the lecture, he has some urgent work. Uh, so uh, should I go for the next lecture? Yes, I think that would be the uh, right thing to do. I want to thank okay. everybody for uh, your careful listening and uh, I, Going back to Cleveland Clinic now um, uh, to resume my clinical work after a nice little vacation in Arizona. So thank you everybody for your time. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, for thank being you. here today. And we learned a lot for the last uh, few sessions as well. And uh, we wish you a very good safe uh, flight and uh, good luck. Thank you. Okay, thank you again.